I do once again want to take this opportunity to both thank you and welcome you here this evening for the first of our Lenten reflections across the Diocese of Greensburg. And it is truly a delight for me to be able to be with you this evening and offer this reflection to you. Uh, the reflections that we are doing throughout this Lenten season are reflections that give us an opportunity to look upon especially the Gospels of the weekends of our Lenten journey. And of course, as we do so, the themes of each of these talks relate not only to that Gospel, but hopefully also help us to reflect on themes that allow us to grow in our relationship with Christ and to help us grow in our own spiritual lives as we journey through this Lent of 2022. And I have to say how wonderful it was not only to see, but also to hear the choir here at Holy Cross. Uh, having come through all of us uh, two years of the pandemic and limitations on many of the liturgical ministries, including many times music ministries and choirs, it's so refreshing and so delightful and so invigorating to hear the choir and to together raise our voices in evening prayer as we honor and worship God. As we gather on this first full week of the Lenten season, every year on the first Sunday of Lent, the church gives us in the gospel passage one of the stories that relate to the temptation of Christ in the desert. And of course, this year, we see and hear that we proclaimed the temptation of Jesus as is given to us in St. Luke's Gospel. And in each of these renditions of Jesus' temptation in the desert, we see that the church focuses on this theme on the first weekend of Lent because it helps us not only to understand the beginning of Jesus' public ministry, but how Jesus prepared for that public ministry of proclaiming God's word, teaching us about the kingdom of God, and indeed giving examples of the tremendous miracles that he performed in his apostolic work. And it reminds us too that immediately after Jesus receives his baptism in the Jordan, he goes out into the desert for a period of 40 days. And there, as we know, he spends his time in prayer and in fasting. And of course, what this does is it gives us a beautiful model for our own annual retreat into the Lenten season. And like Jesus going into the desert, we follow in his footsteps so that we too, taking 40 days of prayer and fasting, may better prepare ourselves for the celebration of the great Paschal mysteries, Christ's suffering, death, and his resurrection. And as Jesus does that, he also gives us a beautiful model of how we ourselves are called not only by imitating these disciplines, but by following his example in this earthly life, that we too, like him, can overcome the temptations of our world and that we can strive constantly to avoid sin. In the Gospels of St. Luke and St. Matthew, the devil actually comes to Christ, and as you recall, as we heard this past weekend, he presents him with three different temptations. And of course, what we see is that first, 
Jesus is tempted with 40 days as he has been fasting. And of course, we're told in sacred scripture, when does the devil come to Jesus? Not at day one, not at day 10, not at day 20, not at day 30, but he comes at the end. He comes at the end of Jesus' 40 days and so Jesus, having fasted for 40 days in his human condition, is experiencing what any of us would experience, physical hunger. And that first temptation that comes is the temptation of the devil to Jesus to appease his hunger. Turn these stones into bread eat, have your fill. Don't fast, don't empty yourself out, but fill yourself, eat well. And of course, the second temptation comes to Jesus. And that temptation, again, remember, is what? Jesus is offered by Satan all the kingdoms of the world if Jesus would, would worship him. And then we see Jesus turning. And what does Jesus say? He goes to the heart of the Mosaic commandments, the law on Mount Sinai, the number one commandment. I am the Lord your God. I alone shall you worship. And so then the devil comes with the third temptation. And this third temptation is a promise made by Satan to protect Jesus from the test. Throw yourself down. I will raise you up. Don't allow yourself to undergo the passion and the cross. Why would you want to die for this miserable lot of humanity? And Jesus, of course, again, the third time, turns and he says to the devil, get behind me, Satan. Three times, Satan tempts Jesus in the desert. Three times, Jesus does not succumb to the temptation. We know that three is a very important number in our Christian tradition. When we think of three, probably the first thing that comes to us is the Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. But also as we're in this Lenten season, and particularly when we move into the sacred Triduum and Easter, we see that number three again occurring on the night of Christ's Passion. And I always think it's very interesting that the scriptures remind us that after the third temptation, it says, Satan departed him for now, reminding us that all of the temptations that occurred in that desert were not the end, but the devil, being persistent, would return, and he does return. When does he return? In the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus is praying. There's a powerful scene in The Passion of the Christ, the movie, where Jesus is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, and he's there in prayer. And the full realization of the Father's will that he would die for the sins of the world is upon him. And as Jesus is conforming his will to the Father's will, there's this great scene 
that as Jesus is looking down and he's beginning to cry the tears of sweat, the tears of blood, this black snake comes and it hisses. And of course, it's representative again of Satan, going back to the very foundation of original sin in the Garden of Eden and the snake coming to Adam and Eve. And there Jesus, the new Adam, is confronted again with the serpent. And in that moment of temptation, unlike the old Adam, the new Adam again resists temptation. And he does not give in to the devil's tempting to say, walk away from the cross. Walk away from the pain. Walk away from the suffering. But Christ embraces God's will, which is an embracing of the cross. I was thinking about that as I come to Holy Cross Parish in Youngwood and was beautifully looking up during the psalmody to the beautiful image of St. Helen that you have here holding the cross. And many times we pray prayers and we sing songs that remind us, take up your cross, embrace the cross, from the cross shall come the crown. We've sung them, we've prayed them how many times? But do we ever think of ourselves of saying that part of that embracing of the cross is not just embracing the trials, the tribulations, the anxieties, the worries, and the fragility of our human lives, and a turning away from sin, but also, as Jesus reminds us, clinging to the cross helps us not to cling to sin and to avoid and resist temptation. My dear friends, when we think about the three temptations of Christ, we can think about in our everyday culture and even in our human condition, but I think even more so today in our own world, three isms, as I call them. And these isms are not good isms, <laughs> they're negative isms that we have to avoid. And in the first temptation, we see that human frailty coming to us because of original sin and our human frailty places as a contrast to fasting the human longing of physical hunger and emptiness that is striving to be fulfilled. And of course, the challenge or the opposite of hunger is satisfaction. And in our world, we must be careful that the first great temptation is that we do not fall into hedonism. That we are filling ourselves for the sake of pleasure and satisfaction. I used to always say when I was growing up, and probably most of you were growing up, when we thought about hedonism, we thought about those material things, <laughs> eating or pleasures of the body, whatever it might be. I often think today sometimes in our world, technology is a big part of this hedonism. Think about it. We fill ourselves with a constant almost um, manic desire for connectivity in the virtual reality of the world. The second ism that relates to the second temptation is what I say egoism. Ego, of course, means I in Latin. And so it's all about me. Now, I'm sure none of us ever think that it's all about us, isn't it? 
But when we think about our world today, isn't it interesting? I'm always amazed and probably many of you like myself grew up in cultures, especially in Southwestern Pennsylvania, where so many of the people worked extremely hard in the industrial world, in their work, the time that they worked, the ways in which they worked. They worked hard, they worked long. And think about it so many times, you know, the work ethic was something that was both a sense of pride, but also an expectation. You know, I was expected to put in so many hours. And it's always amazing to me how, how things are changing. <laughs> how much time can I have off? <laughs> how much time I need for myself? You know, love to do that, but I need me time. Think about that second temptation. And what is the devil saying? Throw yourself down. And it's about might and power, about me. What's Jesus saying? If anyone, if anyone could say it's about me, it would be Jesus, right? I'm the second person of the blessed Trinity. It's about me. Yet he says, no, it's about God. It is about God. And my dear brothers and sisters, I think so often this second temptation translated into egoism, egoism in our own world today has a lot to do with even our time that we spend in prayer or at mass or enveloping ourselves into the spiritual and corporal works of mercy. That's for the priest. That's for grandma. She likes to go to daily mass. I've got important things to do. The third ism that ties to the third temptation is one that's very familiar to us. Materialism. The things of the corporal world. Those kingdoms. That wealth. And I think sometimes we can often say, well, you know, I'm not a wealthy person, but I like my things around me. And I often say, what gives us comfort? Sometimes it's surrounding ourselves with things. You know, we're feathering the nests. You know, I have to point the finger at myself. I like to get into our car. I like to roll down the window, pull down the top. You know, whatever it might be. But we are so amazingly blessed with what we have as a nation and as a people. And probably you've been thinking about this a lot the last couple of weeks as I have. When you look at what's happening in Ukraine and you look at people literally moving and moving from their homes because their homes have been destroyed. And you know, how many times did your parents or grandparents or great grandparents tell you the story, you know, I literally came here with a bag or I had this, and oh yeah, Grandma, let's hear that story again. You know, we're eating our pizza and gorging, and, oh yeah, and turn up the heat, or turn on the air conditioning. I'm a little hot, Grandma. And you walked uphill both ways, didn't you, in the snow? But boy, when you saw those pictures, and continue to see those pictures, huh? Literally, maybe a purse, or maybe even nothing, because they have one child in one hand, another child in another hand, nothing. we think about what we have, what we discard every day in our garbage cans, materialism. Jesus reminds us it's not about all the kingdoms of the world, but it's about the kingdom of God. We can see why the church gives us this reading as we enter into the Lenten season because it really reminds us in these temptations all that Christ did by his suffering and death about being that new Adam and setting us free from our sins and our failures. You know, St. John the Evangelist in his epistle, epistle calls these temptations in the world 
by three things. I use the term hedonism, egoism, and materialism. St. John the Evangelist refers to hedonism as lust of the body. He calls egoism the pride of life. And materialism, I love this one. It's like old school, like the nuns would teach you. Lust of the eyes. Think about it, lust of the eyes. And when we think about all of that, my dear brothers and sisters, we are mindful that when we think about temptation, we are given this example of how Jesus resists in his human nature that temptation. And I think the great temptation for all of us is we can say, well, that was Jesus, he was God, and he could do that where we couldn't. It's very clear in the Gospels. Jesus, in his human nature, is resisting these temptations by his conforming his will to God and his obedience to God and the grace of God. Because what is Jesus doing? He is reminding us that God is God. We are not the first commandment. Many years ago in my first pastorate, I was in a wonderful, beautiful rural parish. And I had so many wonderful parishioners there. And it was probably only a couple of months after I had arrived in my first pastorate, I was invited to dinner at this wonderful parishioner's home. And only later did I realize that, yes, certainly it was a gracious invitation to welcome me as a new young pastor to the parish and to get to know this family. But I also come to know that there was a little underlying other reason for it. The husband and wife were extremely devout, very faithful Catholics, very good family people. As a matter of fact, tremendous farmers. But they had a child, a son, who had stopped practicing the faith and was not very much interested in the things of God. <laughs> and uh, part of my time and that invitation was, I think, meant as an opportunity for him to be reintroduced to the church through a priest and maybe have an opportunity to have a, a great moment of conversion. And uh, as we're sitting at this beautiful, older table that had been a family heirloom, and we had a wonderful meal. We're in the midst of the meal, and the son says out of the blue, I don't believe in God. You could see the mother was just mortified. And the father just kept cutting the roast beef. I, as a young priest and pastor, simply went, mm -hmm. uh, and immediately, I have to say of my own accord, uh, moved the conversation in another direction not addressing the bold statement that was made. We go about five more minutes into the meal, and I think now I'm into some of the carrots, and I hear again, I don't believe in God. The mother again plays with the napkin. Father, would you like some mashed potatoes? The dad says, would you like some more carrots? I said, yes, both, please, thank you. <laughs> About five or ten minutes later in the conversation, can you imagine what he said? <gasps> this time even louder, and this time with a fork in one hand and a knife in another, and he pounded on the table and he said, I don't believe in God. And I will never forget this. I'm thinking, okay, what's the response? And before I could respond, the wise father puts down his knife and his fork. He takes his napkin out from underneath his neck, and I thought, oh, he's going to lay him out. <laughs> he did, not physically, 
he turned to him and he said, using his name, it's pretty hard to believe in God when you think you are God. It's pretty hard to believe in God when you think you are God. I will never forget that. I use it a lot when I'm talking to the confirmation students and we talk about the gifts of the Holy Spirit. And one of my favorites, of course, is fear of the Lord. And I will often sometimes ask them, how do they define fear of the Lord? I think we even translate it a little differently today. Uh, we say awe and wonder in his presence, but I sort of like the old fear of the Lord, you know. That's what we were taught with. And uh, I will uh, ask them that question, and it's always very interesting. But then I usually use that example to say, how I like to think about fear of the Lord is knowing that God is God and I'm not. And when we think about that, at first blush, we may say, well, of course I'm not God. But how many times are we tempted to act in line with that phrase that we may believe we're God, just as God is God? And I think as we reflect on the temptation of Jesus, and when we look at the isms, when we look at the temptations, and when we look at St. John the Evangelist's even terms, all of that relates to that Jesus, who is the one who could say, back to the dad at the table, I am God, <laughs> doesn't. He defers to God to show us how we must always defer to God. And his deferring to God is not simply sweet and saccharine devotional salutations or polite deferences. He defers to God as God in his humility and laying aside his divinity to mount the cross. The early church fathers would often say that on Good Friday, when Christ mounted that cross, that sign of the greatest temptation, if you are the Son of God, come down from the cross. And Jesus doesn't because he lays aside his own glory for the sake of saving humanity. Can you imagine the temptation he must have felt knowing that in a split second, he could not only come down from that cross, he could indeed show material, earthly power beyond all knowing. And to me, one of the things he could have said is, uh-huh, uh, who's laughing now? But he does it by obeying the will of the Father. And the real joy and the real laughter comes on Easter. But the church fathers would often say, when Christ mounted that cross, the screams from hell rose to heaven because Satan knew. Satan knew without a doubt he lost. He lost. And my dear brothers and sisters, when we think about that, I'd like you to also think about just as we see the temptations that Jesus faces, how he overcomes those temptations, in that same way, we can take, I think, three very important virtues that can help us imitate the strength and the grace that Jesus exhibited. The first is the virtue of fortitude. When we think about hedonism or we think about hunger, we think about filling that hunger with satisfaction, 
The grace of fortitude, or what we often say, one of those great gifts we received at confirmation, is the gift called courage. That courage is to see that even when Jesus' life was in danger, or even when our lives are in danger, even though we may be very hungry or we may be very weak in any way, that we are able with strength and courage to reject the bread of the devil and choose rather the bread of life. When we think about the second temptation, the great virtue we can embrace I would contend is prudence, or one of the terms we often use is caution. <laughs> I always do that when I'm talking to younger people, and prudence is such a big word, but caution. You know, when rejected, we can overcome egoism of ourself by being very cautious and saying, it is not focusing on me, what I'm doing in my thought, word or deed should not be to me but to be to god christ and our neighbor you know, the sisters used to always say don't point at anyone because when you point a finger you've got three pointing back at you <laughs> right it's not about me and the third virtue to sort of complement the temptations would be temperance, self-control. <laughs> if you're like me, you think about that, you go, wow. You've been hearing me preach a lot if you've seen my video on that, and I have often say old school Lent. You know, I often think that the traditional disciplines of Lent are classic. They're part of the very depth and breadth of our Judeo-Christian tradition, prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. And when we think about that, especially with fasting, in a world, in a nation, in a culture where we have so much, not just food, but so much material possessions, so much luxuries and comfort, fasting is fantastic because what does it do? It really allows us to enter into a sacrifice that can model so beautifully the sacrifice of Christ on the cross. It also empties us, not that we refill ourselves. I always say it's like spring cleaning. You want to clean out the closet, but you don't want to clean out the closet so you can fill it back up again with the clothes. You want to clean it so that it can be filled with the things of God. That's what we do with our soul. Get rid of what is filling us with the world and fill it with God's grace and with the things of the world and then almsgiving. When we think about almsgiving, we think about how we give, not from our surplus, but really from our need. We give from our blessing. And when we do that, how much comes back to us? And when we think about prayer, we come to realize how important that prayer is. I would contend that just as we've talked about the three temptations, We've talked about the opposites of those temptations of isms in our lives that are, can be tied into the sin when we reflect too much on those areas. I would also say, let's parallel also, along with those three virtues that I mentioned, for fortitude, prudence, and temperance, let's also think about the three disciplines of Lent, prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. And when we think about that, Jesus models that story for us. The story of the temptation starts our journey into Lent because as we've examined and as we've reflected and as we know so well, it contains so many of the elements, not only of what we are professing, what we are striving to accomplish and what we are doing during this Lenten season, but what does it do? Like the people of Israel, we move into the desert to move through the desert. We don't stay in the desert. And Jesus didn't stay in the desert. He moved out of the desert, and what did he do? He moved into his three-year public ministry. In that same way, we are called through this annual re-entering into the desert figuratively 
to allow it to be a time of purification as we move towards the Paschal celebration. And this is a model of our discipleship and our journey. As I've been going around the diocese with our synod listening sessions, I have to say there are some very consistent themes that are coming up, no matter what geographical part of the diocese I'm in, no matter what demographic I'm in. And you know what it is? It's two major things. People are saying, Bishop, how do I get my children and grandchildren back to Mass? How do I get my neighbor to re-engage in the practice of the faith? What's our future? How do we re-engage them? The world is weighing heavy upon them, and the gospel of the world is consuming them with the message of the world. And part of the reason I've undertaken these Lenten reflections throughout the diocese is the second thing. Bishop, we need to hear more about what we believe, what we profess, and what the church teaches. And as adults, we're hungry for it. As children, we need it. In youth, we need it even more. And that's what our discipleship is, a constant, a constant learning and growing. And that's my hope that in these times, short or long as these reflections may be, there are moments to help us stop and pause, to reprioritize our lives. And I think all of us would not disagree. We need it. But I think we also sometimes say to ourselves, how do we start it? <laughs> it's hard. I hope that as we reflect tonight, that I encourage you to enter into this Lenten season. Make it a time of great prayer, fasting, and almsgiving. <laughs> Make it a time when, indeed, uh, the Lord may strengthen you and your loved ones. Basically, what the temptation of Jesus teaches us, if we were to ask for a one-line take-home test, what did you learn tonight? <clears throat> I would hope you would be able to say, and maybe even continue to pray, almost like a fervorino, that Jesus' responses to the temptation of the devil teach us how we can respond to temptation. I'll say that again. Jesus' responses to the temptation of the devil teach us how we can respond to temptation. I'd like to conclude tonight <clears throat> with today, Wednesday of the first week of Lent's prayer over the people. If you're familiar with the Roman Missal, in the tr new translation of the Roman Missal, <clears throat> every day of Lent, there is an option for the priest after the prayer after after communion to impose a special more solemn prayer before the blessing of the people occurs and every one of those prayers is different for the different days of Lent and this morning as I was celebrating mass and I was offering this prayer I said wow talk about the Holy Spirit for my talk tonight and I'd like to carefully conclude with that prayer for today over the people for this Wednesday of the first week of Lent. And here it is. Listen to it carefully. Watch over your people, Lord, and in your kindness cleanse them from all sins. For if evil has no dominion over them, no trial can harm them.